Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4 this morning, and it's uh, quite a famous passage, The Temptation of Christ. Um, there's a lot in here, and I'm going to pray for us that God, the Holy Spirit, would speak to our hearts. Let's just open our hearts to the Lord. Let him come and speak to us. Father, thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for this precious Precious book, Lord, we thank you. It's more than just mere words on a page, but it's the very word of God given to us, our bread, our food from heaven. And we come to you this morning, Lord, saying we're hungry and we thirst for God. Lord, we've we've drunk from this world, Lord. We've tasted of this world and it proves to be empty, Lord. But we thank you that there is another kind of food that our hearts hunger for, and it's your word. And so we pray this morning that you would come, Holy Spirit, open our eyes, Lord, open our hearts, give us ears to hear, Lord, give us understanding, Lord, help us to understand these things, that we wouldn't be confused or blind, but Lord, open the eyes of our hearts to your holy word, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. In a moment of time. And he said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So we're about to embark on a cosmic battle. And uh, this is a battle not just in the way that we often know temptation and battles. Yes, we have demonic battles, right? Our battle's not against only flesh and blood, but there are principalities and powers. We're very aware of that from Scripture. But this is still a unique battle because this is Satan himself. It's not one of his minions or demons that has come to test the Lord. This is Satan himself. This is the Highest of all dark powers, the devil. His name means accuser or, he, or liar. <clears throat> and so let's not underestimate the intensity of what Jesus is about to endure. And um, he is led by God into the desert. And where we come in is at the very end, 40 days. And we're told he ate nothing during that time. So you have to really understand he's been tempted And yet God was pleased to reveal what was happening on the very last day, right at the end. This is going to be the most intense time for Jesus in his weakness and in his frailty. But in order to understand this, I want to give a little bit of background that comes outside of this passage, just so this will really take on meaning. Okay? Do you remember the very first Adam back at the beginning in the garden? There was someone there. Do you remember that? Satan was there, and he came to the very first man who came into this world. And the Bible explains that Adam was supposed to be the head. He was supposed to represent the human race. In other words, his life has a direct impact on those who are born in him. Does that make sense? Just if your parents, there's consequences, right, to family heritage, family lines, right? 
Adam, in God's way of designing this world, was supposed to represent the human race, and he did. But Satan targeted him. Satan went after him. And when he sinned and gave in to Satan's temptation, it had direct consequences on the human race. Because each one of us is not born a Christian. We're not born religious, or regardless of where you come from, we're born from Adam. And we inherit his curse. Does that make sense? God sent him. He was supposed to represent us. And so what we're about to find out now is another Adam is on the scene. And just in the previous chapter, we find John the Baptist. And he's proclaiming the way, saying, get ready. The one you've been waiting for is coming. Make way. Make his path straight. The Messiah, the one who was promised even back at Genesis chapter 1. Another will come. He's here. Get ready for him. A new man is on the scene. And this is all part of God's plan that he is going to send another Adam who's going to represent the human race. You'll need to be born again. You'll need to get out of Adam. You'll need to be cut off from him if you want to be part of this new man. And interestingly, we see Satan target this man, just like he did at the beginning. And so we have to understand everything that's about to happen is this. Jesus had to be like us in every way. So if we read, uh, you don't have to turn to this, but Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17, it says this. Therefore, speaking of Jesus, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. In other words... Jesus had to live perfectly as a human. No shortcuts. It meant he wouldn't be using his divine power to escape. He would have to live just like you, just like me, but without sin. And ultimately, he's going to go to the cross. And if he's going to go to the cross, he needs to represent you and me perfectly in our place. Does that make sense? If he's a sinner, he's disqualified. Remember, even back to the Old Testament, the lamb that was to be sacrificed, even back then in the tabernacle, it had to be perfect, without blemish. These all pointed to Jesus, who would be that perfect lamb, without sin, like us, but not like us. Okay? So this is the background, and Satan however much he understands about God's promise and his plan, wants to jeopardize the mission. Okay, that is what's going on here. That's the context to understanding what's to unfold. Does that make sense? Okay, I know there's kind of a broad background, but hopefully that I put that in a simple way. <clears throat> so we get to verse 1, and it says this, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan... And was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. I am amazed as you go through this passage how much of a focus is on the Holy Spirit. Have you noticed that? Verse 1 uh, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. A little bit before this, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes upon him in the bodily form like a dove and anoints Jesus. In uh, verse 14, just a little bit at the end of this passage, it says, and Jesus uh, returned in the power of the Spirit. And then a few verses further on, he takes the scroll of Isaiah 61 and says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to set the captives free to bring the good news of God's salvation. Isn't that interesting? The the role of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' ministry and life is fundamental. In other words, 
as, a hum, as the human Messiah, he is to depend on God the Father by the Spirit. Everything he does is going to be by the Spirit. He's going to be led by the Spirit perfectly. He's perfectly in tune with what God is saying. Not my will, but his will. He's in tune with the Spirit. He's in step with the Spirit. And for those of you who may be kind of, what is the Holy Spirit? Uh, you know, I've come across at times where people think, like in Star Wars, the Force. <laughs> is the Spirit, you know, the Jedi? Was Jesus a Jedi? And I'm sure there's some new ages out there that have, you've, I think there's a book called that. You know, some, the, use the Force. And you too can use the Force. Um, well, the Holy Spirit isn't an it. He's not a force. He's not some kind of random energy in the universe that kind of helps you do stuff. Okay? He's a he. He's a person. In fact, the Bible says he's the third person of the Trinity. He's God, the Holy Spirit. And uh, you can find lots of references. Jesus refers to him as the comforter. He's a person. He will guide you. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle talk about it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit when they were trying to make decisions. He leads them. And uh, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, he appears. He's not as prevalent as he is in the New Testament, but primarily he came upon certain people at certain times for tasks, like the kings or Samson in his power and his supernatural strength. That was the Spirit of God upon him. Um, God anointed people when they were building the temple and the tabernacle for craftsmanship, supernatural craftsmanship. You know, imagine, I don't know if you're in construction or a carpenter, but wouldn't that be good to have the Holy Spirit empowering you in your job, you know, crafting? Um, but that's kind of how the Holy Spirit was working. It wasn't for the normal people. It wasn't for everyday people and for everyday life. It was just for certain men who were about to embark on big jobs. And so now we find Jesus continuing in this. He's anointed with the Holy Spirit. As a man, though he was God, putting aside his divine power, he's going to become flesh and he's going to rely on the Spirit. <clears throat> and we'll see how that relates to us in a little bit in the end. So it goes on and says, he returned from the Jordan and then he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness or into the desert. Okay. Let's pause for a moment. Sometimes when you're following God, it will lead you into desert places. The, the, the phony message of come to Jesus and your life will be perfect and happy is false. That's not biblical. It doesn't look like Christianity. It looks like a man-made thing. Often, following Christ will take you to desert places. Yes, sin can lead you there as well, but not always. And what are the characteristics of a desert? Well, it's hot, it's dry, you become thirsty, you're more vulnerable, are you not, in those places? Weak, frail, feeling of lost. I don't know where I'm going. Just life feels like a desert. I'm... Uh, you know, I don't have direction. I feel lost, overwhelmed. And often in the desert place, it's a place of silence. God, where are you? Like, you know, this, I called out to the Lord and nothing. This doesn't make sense. Those are, those are characteristics of desert places, especially in the Bible. And when you look at Israel, who was in the desert for 40 years Interestingly, because of their disobedience, not because of which is the opposite of Jesus, who was obedient, but nonetheless, you find they become vulnerable, they begin to complain, they begin to grumble, their hearts become, became hard. I'll give you an example of following Christ and sometimes ending up in a desert. I remember back to 2015. I, I'd been in ministry, I'd been burnt out. You know, you're doing the work of the Lord, you think you're in his will, and you are in his will, and sometimes suffering happens, bad things happen. And then later on, I, you know, my health was beginning to restore, and uh, we were here in Mount Vernon, and felt the Lord maybe leading us 
to go to Tacoma to join a church of a friend of mine who was part of a similar same uh, church movement. Um, I knew him years back in the ministry. And I was trying to be as really sensitive to God. I don't want to do my thing. I don't want to do my will. I've done that before, and I know that can be dangerous. So, Lord, this time, if it's your will, we'll go. But there was a big part of me that didn't want to go. I don't want to take my kids and uproot them again. I don't like Tacoma. Um, I, I, I really don't. Um, but I met with my friend, the pastor there. He prayed with me, and I said, his name's Bo. And I said, do you, do you sense God in this? I mean, I don't want to, I want to be obedient. My heart is right in this. And he says, yeah, I do. And so I left my uh, kind of job and everything here and um, began to commute for a period of time down that way um, while the kids were still in school. And I found a job at an auto body shop. Hated it. <laughs> Just, I, I felt like in the desert again. I, you know, I was sleeping during the week in the church office, away from my family, away from my friends. I'm trying to do the will of God, right? I'm, tr- I'm trying to do my best here. And it's lonely and it's dry and I feel like a fish out of water. I, I, I don't feel at home. I don't feel like I have home. That feels like a desert. Um, and life got worse from that point. <laughs> and my, my emotional health declined and in the in the end lots of other things took place but ended up coming back and you're wondering lord what happened i didn't even want to go to tacoma and i went obeying you and i sought you on this and this happened well sometimes that does happen Amen. and you may be in a desert And life may be like that, but you're in the will of God. Jesus was in the will of God, and God had a plan, and there is a bigger picture to it. And I just want to encourage you this moment, if you're in the desert, there is a bigger picture. There is a purpose. Stay in the purpose of God. And sometimes it's the question, do you trust God to go? And sometimes the question is, do you trust God to stay? It might be harder to stay. But are you following God's will? Are you walking in step with the Spirit? Or are you following your own desire? Are you here for God or for yourself? Carrying on, verse 3. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Do you remember... Just like it with the first Adam. The devil used the very similar words. Did God really say? Is it really like that? Did he really mean it in this way? It's the, he's using the same old tricks. He's, he has not changed. He's a liar. He uses half-truths. And he also uses diversion. One of the biggest ways the enemy attacks is to get your focus off of truth and onto fear or onto half-truths and lies and doubts and questions. And what he's trying to do here is take Jesus' focus off of obedience to God and onto himself. If you're the son of God, why should you suffer? Why should you go hungry? Remember, it was important that he remained perfectly in humanity. Right? Remember, jeopardizing the mission. As Paul said, though he was God, he did not fight with God or count equality with God something to be grasped. But Jesus humbled himself. He took on flesh, became a servant, walked in the desert, chose not to use his divine rights. We live in a society and culture that's all about rights, don't we? How many times do you hear human rights? My rights. These are my rights, and I'm going to campaign for the rights of this or the rights of that. That's counter to the kingdom of God, which is God's rights, not mine. Your will be done, not mine. And it's easy to fall into that pattern. Well, what about me? Or, that's not fair. 
And here, the enemy's trying to focus Jesus off of the obedience to the Father to, you're God's son, aren't you? Why should you suffer like this? Why don't you turn this bread into stone? Another personal example of the, the doubt thing. I remember in 1995, I'd been a Christian for one year. And man, it had been an amazing time. I mean, I'd been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'd experienced the love of God to the point that I was in tears, crying that I was a sinner. And you know where it talks about, Paul says, the love of God has been poured into our hearts, supernaturally by the... I'd had all that. I mean, it was an incredible conversion. And, oh, I was in love with God. All I wanted to do was tell the world about him. And then about a year later, some things happened, and all the feelings went. And it was such a hard time. It was just gone. It, it was a desert again, and it was silent. Where's the love? I got, Lord, why are you allowing me to suffer this way? What happened? And you could hear the voice, well, looking back in hindsight, are you really God's son? Did that, was that really real? Was all that Holy Spirit stuff, was that not just maybe a figment of your imagination? Was that really God? And those doubts began to creep, and fortunately, God's in control of my life. And I learned to live by faith, not by feelings. And he was forming me in those early days. But it's an example of the devil's schemes. He wants to get you to doubt who you are in Christ. Are you the son of God? Are you adopted child of God? Are you really a Christian? And then in verse 3, turn these stones into bread. What's going on here? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the name AWOL in the military. If you go missing, they say, oh, he's gone on AWOL, absent without leave. Right, aborted the mission. And what's going on here is this. There's the temptation to go solo from God. It's the tempt. I'm hungry. God doesn't appear to be supplying my need. So I'm going to take matters into my own hands. Lord, it's 40 days here. I'm tired, I'm hungry, and I need to eat. You're not providing, so I'm going to go my own way. Do you see what's going on? Independence from God. I'll do it my way. I'll use my own divine power here. I'll jeopardize the mission to live the perfect human life. Okay? What about for, for us in the desert times? You tempted to go solo? You know, it could be this. You're not married. You want to be married. And uh, it's taking too long, Lord. I'll do it my way. I'll provide for my needs my way rather than trusting God his way. I'll turn these stones into bread my way. Yeah, I know she's not a Christian, but, you know, it, it's been a long time and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go for it. I'll take matters into my own hands. I'm not going to trust God. I'm going to do it my way. Or what about this? I'm, you know, we live in a, a sexualized culture. I'm hungry for that. I'm hungry. You're going to turn these stones into bread? I'll satisfy my own sexual needs my way rather than trusting God that he has a way that he can provide in the desert. He supplies when we don't have in our own strength what it is that we need. And Jesus responds and says, man shall not live by bread alone. And then Matthew's account completes the verse from Deuteronomy, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And I'll just read this to you. Uh, in, from, it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And it's when the Israelites were in the desert and they were hungry. And they were complaining because they're hungry. God is not providing. And God was so grace, gracious to them. 
And it says this, he says, And you shall remember the whole way of the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you'd keep his commandments or not. And then he says this, And he humbled you and let you hunger. Sometimes God will let you hunger. Sometimes God will take things away from you to let you hunger. Why? Well, he says, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from his mouth. If you're his child, he cares And he wants to wean you off of the food of this world and the sin of this world. And sometimes, when we're not learning, he disciplines us. It's not because he's angry with us, it's because you're a legitimate child. And you're not going to escape his discipline, which is how we know we're his sons and his daughters, is that we are trained, we are corrected, we are taken sometimes to the desert. And in those places, he teaches us how to drink from him. You used to have all the money. Now it's gone. You can't feed on that anymore. And it forces us to feed on God when we've got nothing. And Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. There's a blessing there. Those who think they have everything find it much harder to come to God. They're distracted. They're blinded. And in verse 4 of that Deuteronomy passage, it says, your clothing did not wear out on you, and your feet did not swell for these 40 years. Isn't that amazing? I, I forgot about that part. But their shoes did not wear out, nor did their clothing for 40 years. That's supernatural provision. And of course, the main Aspect is the food that came from heaven called manna. It was a strange thing. They did not know what it was, but it's like, can you imagine snow? You know, when you see snow, you're like that. But imagine that in the summertime, but it's not cold. It's food that you can eat. But God, that's God's intimate nature with his people. That's who we are as his church. We live by faith and dependency on him. He feeds us and his word is our bread given to us. So Jesus cuts through the distraction, cuts through the deception, goes right to the truth. No, God is enough. I will depend on him. I'll not provide for myself and do it my way. I will lean on him. And then the next, Satan comes to him and says, he shows him in a moment all the kingdoms of the world And he says to you, I'll give you all this authority and all this glory. Just imagine for a moment, in your mind's eye, you see all the, imagine what he saw, all this glory, all these kingdoms, this splendor. You know, in England, we have this phrase, core, when we see something really like, wow. (laughs) I don't think he ever said that. He didn't have a British accent or anything, but core, look at that. You know, you can imagine the, the reality the reality of imagination, those thoughts of, wow, the beauty, the splendor. And Satan comes to him and says, this can all be yours. Do you want it? (sighs) Well, I wouldn't mind. You know, those kind of temptations come our way as well. Whether it's with work, ambition, money, houses. Sometimes it comes to us just in... Church and in leadership, oh, you could be you could be the star here. You know, you could be the like the other guys. That verbi, I'll give you all of this. You could have a mega church. Whew. You can be famous. You know, we laugh at it, but Satan's very crafty, and it happens often very subtly. It can be within your own family. It can happen in very strange ways. But again, just be aware of those temptations that come. They say the three big temptations are money, sex, and power. Those are the big ones. 
And we probably all struggle with at least one of those at different points in our lives. There may be others, but I think there's an aspect of that here. Do you want power, Jesus? Do you want glory? But it comes at a cost if you will worship me. Will you compromise worship for God for worship of something else? Remember, Jesus said you can't serve both money and God. Money's good, but the love of money and the worship of money is not. You cannot serve both. And Jesus deals with the issue right there. The Bible says you shall worship the Lord your God and only him shall you serve. I'll ask you a question, is it worth it? I know people, I've come across things in the past. They've gone their own way. They've done it their way. Was it worth it? You know, sin offers everything, promises nothing. It delivers nothing, really, in the end. It leads to death. And it's a deception. You've been tempted to chase after other things. Or will you serve him only? And then the final temptation we read, verse 9, and Satan takes Jesus to Jerusalem and sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. Because there's a promise in the word that God will send his angels and save you. Now, if you're the son of God, why don't you do that? I always thought this is a strange temptation. I never quite figured out, like, test the Lord. What what does this really mean? But I think you have to go understand the, the context a little bit. He was set on the pinnacle of the temple, right? So imagine this huge, I don't know, we're in Seattle, say, and you're on the, what's the highest building in Seattle? I don't know. Is that it? I don't know. Let's go with that. Or the Space Needle or something, and... Imagine you're being set there with an audience, all can see. Wouldn't it be a pretty easy way for Jesus to prove who he was? If he was to jump off and then an angel caught him? Wouldn't that just kind of accomplish the plan of God a little bit quicker than the way of the cross? I mean, Lord... (laughs) I know you've set out a path, and this is how I'm going to become king. This is how I'll be vindicated, but this would be a much easier way. And it's a lot easier, too. I mean, there's less suffering, less hardship. And so there's this sense that Satan comes to Jesus again to jeopardize the perfect plan of the Father. So throw yourself off. Prove to the world you're the Son of God. Why don't you perform some signs and some miracles if you're the son of God, right? Use your divine rights. Why should, it, why should it take so long? Why should it be so hard? Why Do you need to go to the cross? Is it really necessary? Why don't we just finish it now? Let's get it done. But Jesus responds and says, no, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, it's an issue of the heart. I'm not going to impose my agenda and my will on God's will. I'm not going to try and force him to do something that's in accordance with my will that isn't his. I'm not going to be presumptuous. I'm not going to treat God as if he's like this slot machine. Put the money in and uh, it says it, out, out comes the results. It's not like that. It's we walk by faith and relationship with his promises. We don't misuse his word. We don't abuse his truth. We walk in relationship with him and we serve him, not he serves us. And so that's the gist, I think, of something of the temptation that Satan was getting here for Jesus. Let's test God. Let's abandon God's plan. And then at the end it says... Verse 12, uh, verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him 
until an opportune time. There's a verse in the Bible that says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But don't be unaware of those words until an opportune time. The devil is an opportunist, or as the Bible says, like a, a lion looking for, the, for prey. Okay, he's not fair. He's not, well, that, that's a little, that would be a little bit harsh if I went for him, you know. No, Satan targets us when we're in our weakest moments. He targets us when we're tired, sometimes when we're sick. Just simple stuff, hey, that's a good time to test him. He's going to be a lot less on his game when he's in that frame of mind. Do you remember the, uh, who's seen the, the passion of the Christ? Yeah, many of us. It's not in the Bible at the very beginning, but I think it's a really good depiction where you've got Satan who comes to Jesus in at Garden Gethsemane and he's beginning to whisper. He says, can you really do this? Can you carry the sins of the world? It's too much. It's too hard for you. No man can do this. No man can carry the curse of man's sin upon himself. And though it's not literally there in Scripture, you don't read those specific words, I think it sums up, though, what went on. But Jesus resisted, didn't he? And he says, get behind me, Satan. I will go to the cross. I will go to the Father. And he overcomes, does he not? Jesus overcomes. He made it through those temptations. He fulfilled all of that righteous requirements for you. It wasn't for him. He was already perfect and sinless. He had no need to justify himself. He was the perfect, spotless lamb of God who'd always existed. He took on flesh to live a perfect life for you. He fought those battles on your behalf. Where you hadn't loved God with all your heart, he did. Where you hadn't been obedient to God, he did. Where you weren't perfectly faithful, he was. And at the cross, Jesus represents you. Just like the first Adam, this time with perfect obedience. And at the cross, he's qualified to take away our sins. He removes our sins. And we know, and we know why. We know for sure because of what we celebrated last week. The resurrection. When God raised, and that's important, God raised his son to life, what was the significance of that? It was basically mission accomplished. Done. You've dealt with sin. You fulfilled your perfect righteous requirements for your people. Now he's raised back to the Father again. You see, he came from there. He comes down. Job done. He's back where he belongs back in glory. And people didn't understand, they only saw this part. He's just a man, and they crucified him. They didn't understand this was God in flesh who put aside his divine power for a time, for them, for you. And then lastly, let me just finish with this. In Luke chapter 3.16, this is just before when he gets baptized, John says to him, says to, he says, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It's, it's like a circle. It started with Jesus, anointed by the Spirit to accomplish a task. But it doesn't finish there. When we become Christians, we inherit the promise that we too can live as he did. The spirit upon Jesus wasn't just for him, for us to go and look, wow, that's nice for Jesus. But for all who receive him, we receive the gift of the spirit. That promise to be baptized in him, to be filled with him, is for you and for me. And so we find Paul saying in Galatians, if you walk by the spirit... You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. See it? In Romans it says, 
It's my last verse here. Where is it? Romans 8. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Do you see the parallel? Jesus, the firstborn son, if you like, representing Israel in the desert. He walked by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit. He obeyed God by the Spirit. And now for those of us in Christ, we we receive the same Holy Spirit. God hasn't left you to just figure this out in your own strength. He's given you the Spirit. And we are to walk a Spirit-filled life. That's a supernatural life. And it doesn't mean it's easy. Sometimes it's like chopping wood. You're chopping and you're chopping and you're chopping. You're doing it. Where he says, if you put, put to death the deeds of the flesh, but then it's by the Spirit. It's kind of, I do it, but not I, but the grace of God. It's not, I don't want anyone to think, hey, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and it's just a piece of cake. No, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but you work at it. You put to death those habits. You put to death those temptations. But it's by the Spirit. It's the promise that he has given us. So be watchful. Watch and pray. Don't get caught out. Learn from Israel's failure. Have you grown hard-hearted? Have you got a hard heart? Been in the desert? God hasn't done things the way you thought it would be done. He hasn't done things your way. And the way to get to where you wanted to get to has been longer. The Bible warns us in that. Be careful you don't get a hard heart. That leads to unbelief. But look to Jesus. Become like him. Let's pray, shall we? Yeah. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for him setting the path for us. And we thank you, Lord, you've not left us or abandoned us to just try and follow in his steps. But you've made us born again. And you've given us the gift of the Spirit to empower us. And Lord, we recognize as well that our hearts are to depend on you, to be leaning upon you. And so we ask you again this morning, Lord, fill us again with the Holy Spirit. Refresh our hearts where we've become dry. Empower us again to walk, not according to the flesh, but in the power of your Spirit, Lord. We give all glory to Jesus. We thank you that you carried it all. You did not give up. You're the champion. You accomplished the mission. You, you, you went to the cross. You endured it. You scorned all the shame. And now you're risen. Now you're in glory. And you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God. Amen.